Now the very first area we need to look at this idea of zoning and cross zoning is in our basic verbal interactions. Definition of space, basic body language, our use of touch, our use of gesture and movement, and how we essentially move our basic stance around our subject. So what I've done here is I've mapped out the essential center line of our subject and we have this inside funnel. When we refer to going to the outside, we're talking basically about going towards the end or the extent of this funnel. And generally we're going to the closest side to us. If we assume that most people are right-handed, in most cases we're going to be moving away from their right hand by moving towards ours. And for our purposes, when we talk about funneling or zoning, we're always talking about circling out the majority of the time as we've seen, but in some circumstances, due to tactics or circumstance, we are required to cross zone or work towards the inside. So I'm going to give you a few essential exercises that we absolutely need to integrate into our daily actions and mobility. If I talk about standing in front of somebody in anything from a casual to a slightly escalated, a, a yellow alert scenario, if you will, I am basically existing in that first funnel between the center line of the subject and the outside or their support side. So my hand should be up. I ideally want to be outside of arm's reach. So I'm looking for something at three plus feet, more than a meter, and my hand should be up in a fence. I'm bladed. I'm already zoning out by virtue of being here. I'm actively moving that casual blur around and I'm engaging the subject. Most of the time, we seek to either retreat on that funnel, retreat on that angular line, or else circle further to the outside. And we know that that can exist at the same distance as if we have a, an imaginary stick between us. We know that sometimes I might slip out and move closer by encroaching, by dropping my base, going up with my shields and getting to the side if I have to initiate first contact. But I have a wide assortment of options outside this funnel here. What I need to be very careful about is crossing this virtual center line. When I do cross this center line, this whole area right here is like a landmine because that is the exact distance where he's going to expect me to be, where he's going to have optimal extension with his jab and his cross with many of his kicks, his knees and his elbows. I'm within his funnel of perception, I'm within his attentional resources. He sees me, he can process me, he can expect me to be there and he has full mechanical advantage to deliver shots. So if I do go in, I never want to step on that line, landmine. I'm always looking to either go very close or else very far, three plus feet and more, four, five feet, meter and a half. I want to be outside of arm's reach and usually just outside of kicking reach if I have a choice. So here are a few basic exercises to consider. From our essential stance, if I do need to cross zone, the first thing I can look at is a direct lead step. So in this case, my left foot is forward. I don't want to cross my legs. I want the closest foot to the closest target. And when I zoom in, zone in, I'm usually looking either to bridge arm to the neck. My stances either can be double out with both bridging out to address the bicep and usually hit into the neck and into the throat a bit. Or I might opt to shield with one hand, protecting against the potential of a hook or an uppercut on this side while still addressing the head and going into that spine and that throat. Or I might opt to collapse my frame and spike in. But from all of these, there should be some level of ballistic impact upon arrival, and then I should be looking to immediately zone out onto this funnel. I should be getting outside. What I don't want to do is crash that line and then reside inside the funnel. The funnel is like, it's almost like the key in basketball, the paint. I don't want to be there even for three seconds. I don't want to be there even for one. When I traverse that, I'm looking to get in, through, and out as quickly as possible to the far side. So the first way to do that again is the most direct step, addressing, shielding, and crossing. And even in casual conversation, sometimes we need to invite the person to go. Sometimes I need to step outside the funnel to invite them, which would be my preference, exposing this funnel to them as a path and always being aware and ready and shielded and loaded, ideally not initiating touch and allowing them to go. But in some circumstances, we might see some activity on that far side, they're fidgeting, and maybe I want to be aware of that hand, and so I might opt to cross. Be very cautious about crossing through this power zone, this, this ideal impact zone. I would usually, go, if I'm not going to collide and hit, I'm going to address and be ready, and then invite them over here. So this is a very, very essential first mechanic to have. Opening the door like I'm on a hinge, ready to shield or hit, and then 
crossing in nice and tight, ready to shield and hit, or doing either of those with collision and retraction or collision and entry into my various clinches. In many ways, when we look at this idea of double blocking, kind of padding and checking with the hands, I kind of oftentimes waft with my hands like this to guide the subject. I'll, I'll have my hands ready, always going through the center. When I'm in my casual blur and I'm talking, I might have my hands up and then change leads, or I might have a hand close like a, like a virtual pivot point, which allows me any point to hit if I need to. My hands are always ready, they're functional, something's always close to the face. Always, always. It could be a single point as if I'm, I'm distracting to move across, or it can be a switch of hands, like a changing of the guards. But I should always have a hand up and ready. If I opt to go across and close, sometimes I'll use a slice step. The slice step is kind of those get out of dodge quick diagonal steps where I drop through. In this case, it would be my power back leg going forward, and for that half second in my slice step, I'm almost giving my back, so I really need to switch and turn over. It's not a preference, but sometimes it's a requirement. Generally, if I'm moving in fast and straight, it's going to be my lead hand because it's the closest and it's the fastest. But sometimes the person will move off my initial step, and I'll find myself too far, and now I have to continue with my slice step to get out. So I should train myself to do both a lead step and arrive correctly, and a rear step, and then adapt back to my lead stance. It's the only two options we have in our step, but we have to train both of them. In exactly the same way, if I decide to step far, I want to make sure I'm not volunteering for this. A lot of people will change that, that the, the sort of hinge on their door. They're inviting the person here, they decide to go to the far side, and they step temporarily right into the zone of optimal power for their hit without realizing it. So I want to be very cautious. If I'm not going absolutely into contact and impact, then I should be going absolutely outside of range. So that will either look like stepping over, like a natural walk, always still having a hand up in their presence, up in their business, distracting them and then inviting them. Or it might look like me just taking a second, taking very small steps as I talk on the perimeter, cautious not to cross my feet, little chewing gum steps like I'm chewing the ground, and then inviting them over. So it can be very, very casual, or it can be a little bit more dynamic, like I'm walking, but always ready. Like anything else, walking and chewing gum, we have to practice doing it, because if we don't practice doing it, it's not going to feel comfortable. And I can tell you from experience, when you have to cross that expanse, that maw, to get to the other side, spider senses are tingling, you feel there's a threat over here, they're hiding their hand, they're moving, you just assess either because of where you're standing, environmental factors or actions, other people in the room, you don't feel safe here. So you make the option because of tactics and circumstance to go to the other side, to have closer access to the high probability hand, or to see what he's doing. In exactly the same way, I could be on this side, I might have oriented myself on this side, and for whatever reason, prefer to be on the other side because of action, environment, or preference, and so I, I move across. So I should practice moving myself across. So these are just a few basic self-evident options. But what's really important, guys, is that you know we have an opportunity to train this in every single conversation. In the most casual conversation, you could be talking to your mom. You could literally be working on zoning, trying to make it as subtle and as behaviorally and contextually justified as possible. Practice having your friends using gestures. Practice, become aware when there's zero stress how you can zone in and zone out. Then I can look at my depth, doing it from touch or almost touch, depending on the familiarity, inviting somebody to move. Or I can start doing it with people I know less on the street, uh, acquaintances or complete strangers, looking at the differences in familiarity and distance. These basic ideas of zoning in and zoning out need to be trained in our everyday actions or else they're not going to be there when we need them when the stress is on. So we want to begin with that basic body language awareness, with our basic stance and our movement drills. And then from there, we're going to be in a context, in a position where we can absolutely escalate it, add some stress, and look at striking, grappling, and weapon work.